very excited about this panel. Our first panelist is the amazing Gianna Darville, and she is with the Truth Board um, liaison. She's amazing, but she'll tell you a little bit more about herself once she's seated. Give it up for her, Hanifa. Come on. Hey, hey. <laughs> Next, we have Devery Jacob. She's an amazing actor, filmmaker, and activist. But again, she'll tell you more about herself later. Hi, Devery. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Neka Ogomike, who is an amazing, again, another amazing panelist, WNBA, WNBPA president, WNBA MVP champion, and activist. You may know who she is. I don't know. Obviously, she's amazing. Thank you so much, ladies, for coming and being color coordinated. Oh, yeah. We love this. <laughs> um, so first of all, just for the audience to be a little bit more familiar with you all and the work you do, please tell us a little bit about yourselves. Sure, so I can kick us off. My name is Gianna Darville. I am the Youth Board Liaison at Truth Initiative, which is, of course, a nonprofit that's dedicated um, to making a generation that is free of nicotine and tobacco. Um, I'm really passionate about the activism that I do with them. I've been involved since 2019. I was an ambassador and then trainer, and so I've missed being able to be with amazing people like you um, and get to talk about the ways that nicotine and tobacco affect us as a generation and ways that we can continue to help our own mental health um, and fight against inequities that are kind of perpetuated by big tobacco. So super excited to be here and super excited to talk to these amazing panelists. Seko is a wagon what could we all do go and I hear that every Jacobs you just don't know gonna walk in it again oh hey everybody I'm Devery Jacobs uh, I am an actor and filmmaker uh, mostly known for my role in the latest series reservation dogs uh, where I play the role of Laura Dannon um, and I'm from Gahnawage Mohawk Territory, which is a Mohawk reservation uh, up in Canada. And I'm really happy to be here today uh, on traditional Tangva territory, yes, uh, where they're welcoming, yes. welcoming and hosting each of us uh, on their territory today. Uh, and Yawakoa, thank you so much for having me here today. Hey everybody, my name is Neko Gumake. Um, I just finished 10 years playing for the LA Sparks here Woo! in LA. Uh, <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure being in the city, especially in the off season. I'm not usually here when it's a little colder, <laughs> but uh, I'm so happy to be able to be here and speak to you guys about something that's been not only um, a real revelation for me personally, but also as president of the WNBPA, uh, a huge conversation amongst the player body. Um, when it comes to mental health, but um, I, I'm grateful to be here and um, LA forever. <laughs> yeah. I love this. All right. So before we get into the hard hitting questions, ladies, um, I just wanted to say, you know, and it's been no sec secret that the past few years have been a lot, um, particularly 2020 it was pretty wild. Um, so just wanted to take a moment to check in and just how are you? How are your communities that you're coming from? How has 2021 been as a year that was supposed to be a reset? How has it been for you all individually? Um, I mean, life is a little tough, if we're really honest. You know, it's, it's difficult to be in such isolation for so long and then also having to come out. Like, I know a lot of us have anxiety about being around other people again. Um, and especially during the pandemic, there are a couple of studies that have come out and shown that anxiety and depression doubled among young people in particular during the pandemic. And, you know, we're isolated, we're missing being around people. It's formative to be able to interact with people and to be able to, you know, continue to develop as a person as a result of coming in contact with other people. People. And so not having that, you start kind of questioning yourself. You start trying to figure out what do I actually want to do with my life? Like, is who I am and what I'm doing, like, does it matter? And so I think for me, there's been a lot of self-reflection that hasn't always been super easy, as I'm sure you guys know. Um, but I think coming out of it, if there is a way, you know, to find that silver lining, it's going, okay, I've been able to dig deep and figure out who I want to be and what I want to do and what matters to me. And so I think there have been so many challenges, but there is an opportunity to kind of find some of that inner strength and, and find ways to share with other people in a way that allows me to kind of become more of who I was supposed to be, which I think is, is, is a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, I reflect and echo so much of what Gianna says. I mean, it's been, it's been a wild time to have gotten to this side of the pandemic and and also to still be here and to see that not actually a whole lot has changed um 
I have been fortunate enough to have uh, success with the show um, that I'm a part of. And it's also been a, a bit of a, a struggle with my mental health. I'm someone who goes to therapy regularly and um, have found myself in a situation where I'm between therapists. Uh, and, and that's definitely a, a struggle. And so I, it's just been a matter of like reminding myself not to pick up where we left off and keep doing as much work as we had done pre-pandemic, where the fact that we're supposed to be continuing this pace of working and, and this pace of productivity while still living in a pandemic is, is frankly astounding. And so it's, it's definitely been a, a journey of finding balance and one that I'm still, uh, one that I'm still trying to, to manage. Yeah, you know, Devry, I think what you just said at the end, you know, finding balance and understanding that being gentle and compassionate with first ourselves is very important. And so um, as an athlete, mental health is not, it's been a faux pas for so long because, you know, most people think that what we do is just physical. Um, and uh, in 2020, you know, finding that balance was, it kind of slapped all of us in the face, yeah. you know, and, um, one thing that I can say is I'm very grateful to be here after the year and, and more that much of the world has experienced. Um, but most importantly, not living in that expectation, you know, because clearly what happened is not something that we expected. Um, but most importantly, along the way, as an athlete, someone who, whose job depends on production and, you know, like tactical production, like to the numbers, um, not being tied so much to that in my identity has been really important. And I'll, I'll have to say this year, I really struggled with that. Um, this summer, I experienced um, probably the biggest injury of my career. Um, and then one of the biggest career disappointments that I had experienced. And so um, I, was in a, I was in a space of really questioning my worth yeah. in ways that I hadn't before. Um, all compounded with what we've been experiencing, all compounded with my experience as an athlete up until this point. And I think what I learned most about it and what I think everyone needs to understand is that, you know, even me with the platform that I have, the platforms that we have, <laughs> shit isn't perfect. It's not, it's never is. And being okay with that is really what is, is really where it really resides. And so I think, um, Understanding that that is a process and not a destination is also something that I've really leaned heavily on. So I'm grateful to be up here and learning so much from, I mean, this is the first question, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I Let's really love, it. I love where we're at right now. I, I wanted to pick up off of what you're saying, Neka, because um, as a president of the Players Association, um, essentially, you've been doing a lot of work with the collecting um, collective bargaining agreements, right? Trying to essentially advocate for the players, um, for their needs. And we talked about this early on a call, but like there's been a lot of discussion this year about athleticism and mental health and literally your body is part of your work, right? And so I'm curious, is any of the work you're trying to do in terms of getting access to help for players involving mental health um, resources? What have you learned over the past year that are some things that you know players need that maybe you didn't know or think about before? Um, how does that show up in, in sort of that advocacy work in terms of the union? Yeah, this, is, um, this has been a, kind of a subject that's permeated much of the work, especially in our recent collective bargaining agreement. Um, you know, there was so much that I didn't realize that athletes needed because I wasn't directly experiencing it. Even as president, I try to talk to as many people as I can to ensure that I'm doing what I can to represent their interests and what they need. Um, but ultimately, when we really wanted to kind of create a bang with such a monumental collective bargaining agreement, it took listening. And I've been saying this since 2020. Leading starts with listening and empowering people who don't have the space, who don't necessarily have the agency to be able to express their experiences so we can now find common ground or not. Right. I think the space in between commonalities and differences is really where the, the work like lies. And so when it comes to mental health, my first experience with understanding needing to bring more resources came when players who were mothers, planning mothers, did not have the resources that they need um, to continue to do their jobs, to continue to help raise their families, to continue to plan raising their families. And that specifically um, came up to me when there were athletes that didn't have resources necessary to deal with 
after birth, you know? Not just training your body. I mean, our bodies are our bodies, but like our brain is a part of our body as well. Our heart is a part of our body as well. And so understanding that there were no resources for that was really saddening. And, and ultimately too, we talked about this before on a call, um, for, for WNBA players, like a lot of people claim to don't watch us, but they do. You guys watch us. Oh yeah. Oh, so, yeah. you know, that stigma creates this idea that, you know, it's not worth investing in. Mm. And, and ultimately women are worth the investment because yeah. we always live in the work, you know, we're born in it. Um, and it's not exclusive. Feminism is not exclusive to women either. So standing by other women, other women identifying people and those who support women is very important. Um, because it rises all of our boats. And so when it comes to advocating for our mental health, it's, <laughs> it really should be a non-negotiable. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's continuing to be a cry for help because we don't necessarily have those resources available to us, let alone the ears listening to what we have to say. Um, so we got to keep talking. We got to keep talking together to the point where we're just banging down the door where people understand like this is not only necessary for our jobs, but for our livelihood. Amen. Um, Devery, I wanted to ask you because um, we spent a lot of time thinking about this last year at Teen Vogue, but, you know, Native people were the most disproportionately affected by COVID. And that's something that just was not talked a lot about, but it's true. Um, and those communities are already at a disadvantage, you know, being stolen their land and all that. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of conversations that we're having about reparations and, and those conversations. But from your experience growing up, you know, having this indigenous sort of heritage and, and um, knowledge. What do you think are the most pressing things that are needed right now in terms of mental health care and um, just overall care? Uh, and what are some things that are getting better? Like what's kind of a positive um, aspect to indigenous, you know, livelihood right now? What a question. <laughs> um, being from my community, there's a few there's a few things um, that I would say are pressing in that are needed across Indian country, north of the border, south of these fictitious borders that have been implemented on our territories. Um, but a lot of them, so many reservations and reserves across North America don't have access to clean drinking water. Mm. And how are you supposed to prevent against COVID if, for in some instances in the Arctic, uh, they can't even wash their hands or there there isn't even a boil water advisory in places like Nunavut because there is literal fossil fuels in the water that they have so having conversations about mental health I can see how it can be so difficult when there are specific basic human needs that are not being met for indigenous folks and so it doesn't mean that those conversations aren't still necessary for our communities. Um, mental health in indigenous communities is also something that is um, that has statistics at the at the highest of rates and disproportionately from other communities. Um, and some of the some of the mental health issues that we're facing are issues like intergenerational trauma um, and impacts from the genocide that's happened in in the countries now known as Canada and the US but I will say some of the positive things is that with this upcoming generation and and with the conversations in our community are centered around healing and and are very much community driven and that was also one of the reasons why COVID was such a difficult thing for our communities to reckon with is because we are so community driven you are as an indigenous person who you are in relation to and we're so used to living together in big families and houses so it ended up making uh, it very difficult but that's also one of our strengths is our is our sense of community is our our sense of humor um, and a, our ability to lean on each other and now the conversation of of truly healing from from all of the all of the things that have happened to us um, is a conversation that is on the forefront for for many of our communities and that's that's one of the really positive things moving forward yeah um speaking of that in terms of like targeted sort of communities um we talked a little bit about this gian on the call but i you educated me honestly the difference between the consumers of tobacco versus vaping mm -hmm. but also right the difference in how quickly the government was to try to eradicate vaping but tobacco has been around for a while and 
disproportionately affects black and brown people as well. So first of all, I wanted you to kind of explain that for those who don't know, kind of the difference in that consumer marketing, maybe why there's a difference. Um, and then, you know, the work that you're doing or hopefully that, you know, you can impart on us to understand how both avenues are not a way to better cope with mental health issues. Because I think a large part of it is, oh, I smoke to, you know, calm down, relax. You know, I vape to relax, but it's actually counterproductive. Yeah, for sure. So anytime we have this conversation, it is kind of important to give that background where for years upon years upon years, as far as when I was born and well before then, um, these vulnerable communities have been targeted by tobacco companies in their marketing and the way that they go about selling um, their products. And so there are all kinds of things from, you know, giving samples of cigarettes to black and brown communities from long, long ago to now kind of rebranding um, nicotine vaping as this new way to be able to eradicate stress, which is at record record highs among our communities, um, and especially among um, the queer community, among um, indigenous people, et cetera, um, where you're in this position where you want to be able to feel better and you don't know how. And if someone's telling you, hey, guess what? This is going to be perfect for you because there's this targeted marketing toward you, um, you end up falling into habits and into those same traps that happened for our parents. And so um, with that being kind of the, the framework that we're working from, we're now at this place where I know a lot of you guys were aware of the vaping epidemic that kind of really came to a head um, this past year and still this year as well, which led to um, all kinds of bans and things of that nature. But it was really interesting because the overwhelming majority of nicotine vapors are Caucasian males. And so it's really interesting when something affects Caucasian males, all of a sudden change happens, <laughs> where we still have menthol cigarettes, which are basically the only flavor cigarettes that anybody uses, which is overwhelmingly used by black Americans. And so you're noticing that these things that we think are, you know, so long ago, I've seen so many memes where people are like, ill, smoking, whatever, and I'm not here to judge or anything like that, but where you notice that people think that this is an issue that doesn't exist anymore, where during the pandemic especially, a lot of young people were turning to vaping to go, okay, I want to relieve my anxiety, I want to feel better about my depression, where also overwhelmingly they end up feeling 10 times worse. Mm -hmm. And so the whole idea is going, okay, let's call it for what it is, where there's this social justice issue of us and our siblings and our parents kind of still falling prey to the same tactics. Um, there are researchers in DC that noticed when you walk into a shop that sells you know, cigarettes or tobacco, if you're in an area with more black Americans, it's gonna be up to 10 times more likely to have advertisements for smoking. And so noticing, okay, cool, my community's being targeted. I'm not really okay with that. And then also noticing this crisis of mental health that's kind of colliding at the same time among young people. Because even though it's more so among among Caucasian young males, it's still something that happens to so many people. I have friends who are in medical school who are going, oh yeah, I'm so stressed out, I'm gonna vape to try to feel better, not realizing that this is something that was damaging their health even worse. And so, especially as we're experiencing all of these things that make us really question our worth, that make us question um, our, our relationships with our families and our communities, and we're, we're going through all of these crises at the same time, recognizing what are healthy outlets and also ways to be able to quit. And so that's why I've been so happy to you know, participate with Truth for as long as I have, because we've been working with um, minority serving HBCUs, we've been working with women colleges to be able to give them grants. Since 2005, I think we've been able to do $2.5 million in grants to help these colleges go tobacco and nicotine free. Um, we've been able to do a couple of different campaigns where um, we, we help black people really realize what it is that's kind of being targeted at them. We have a campaign where people my age and who look like me were able to read some of these comments from big tobacco executives from years ago who talk about things like, oh yeah, we should make sure that they know about this because they're dumb, they're not gonna realize what it means, they're broke, this is gonna be something that makes them feel better. And these are historical targeting practices. Like these things exist online. Like there are transcripts of meetings where they essentially just crap all over all of our communities and go, okay, and that's why we're gonna make sure they stay sick. And so this is an opportunity for us to be able to find this real sense of empowerment and go, okay, I choose to not only reject it, but I choose to inform other people who look like me and who don't so that they know and they can make better choices and they can choose to do something different that helps all of us feel better, that helps all of us be able to approach and confront our mental health in a healthy way. And so. We have a, m a million different resources. You can see on, on Truth's website, we have Vaping Know the Truth, which is a curriculum that we have in schools that's absolutely free. I um, mean, might see a familiar face in it. 
maybe. <laughs> but um, it's all of these different opportunities to be able to give people the information that they need to make the choices that they really want to make. Um, there's never an atmosphere of judgment because that's never helpful when you're talking about mental health or anything else. Um, but it's really this idea of empowering people to make decisions that allow them to live their best life. And I think that's the most important thing. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Um, so something that you kind of all have said in different ways, because um, we always talk about like normalizing mental health, but particularly for black and brown communities, there's so much generational trauma and very specific targeting of us. Um, and it's hard to have conversations about mental health a lot of times when it feels like there's more pressing things that need to be dealt with, yeah. right? Um, and so I'm wondering, I'm just curious, you know, how do you approach those conversations within your spaces of, of really committing to working on, you know, like you said, like Neka said, mental health is, it's physical. It's a part of your physical, your heart, your brain, everything is a part of your ecosystem of living and thriving. And so how do you approach that conversation within your communities, you know? I mean, me, I'm first gen African, like Ghanaian. And so, you know, me having a conversation about mental health with my parents is like a foreign thing. It's just like, get money, be successful, right? You know what I mean? But like, it is important. It is, it is healthcare. And so how do you guys approach that conversation of one, mental health wellness within your spaces? I mean, I'll have to say that it's not, um, it's not easy because like you said, it's not customary. I'm also first gen as well, Nigerian. And so, um, unfortunately, you know, the generations before us weren't really raised in that way. Um, and we're now, you know, we're now kind of breaking that generational habit. Um, but I think, uh, I think really just providing space for the conversation, for the dialogue is really, is really where it's at. Um, you can't just be like, Debra, what's going on? You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you know, like you have to kind of ease into it, but first and foremost, you kind of have to have the conversation with yourself first before you can really engage in your community. But it's cyclical, you know, like you can't engage in your community if you don't reflect on yourself and then vice versa. And um, I can't tell you that there's any right way to do it, but I do know that having the awareness, having the actualization, the realization, the reflection, um, and understanding that, um, I heard this quote the other day, being, having the expectation of being understood is not where you should start. Yeah. You know, it's not where you should start. It, of course, can be a goal and not an expectation, but um, affording you, you that grace and also my grace to Devery, my grace to Gianna, my grace to Danny. Like, it, you have to make sure that you're starting with yourself um, in a way that empowers others to also join that space and join that dialogue. And when it comes to family, like, I mean, <laughs> your parents, you know, they're kind of how they are. But I think also too, the beauty in the inception of it is kind of where people can also realize things that they never thought they would have, you know? And you can learn things in a way that becomes so interpersonal, which develops the community that, um, that really brings life to what we do every day. So yeah. Yeah, I'd also say that in, in my community, there is an understanding that language revitalization is harm reduction, that cultural revitalization and participating in ceremony also helps your spirit and helps, helps your mental health. And I, I'm someone from my community who is pushing the conversation further or hoping to in, in talking about mental health and, and seeking out mental health services. Uh, I know Sagotiat de Genhas, which is the community services, is overrun in, in my community with people in desperate need of, of mental health services. Uh, and so in one of the ways that I do that in my family and my community throughout Indi Indian country um, is by being open about my mental health and, and where I'm at and, and hopefully destigmatizing the idea of therapy or, or the fact that I'm attending therapy doesn't necessarily look in this Western institutionalized way because cultural specificity is so important when it comes to mental health and the way that our communities operate. Um, and so finding ways in which we can decolonize mental health spaces but also um, being open about the, the journey that I'm on and, and in the 
services that I'm seeking to make sure that I'm taking care of myself, body, mind, and, and spirit? Um, something that I always think about when we talk about things like this. I'm a communications nerd. It's what I study. Class of 2020, anybody? No. Oh, whoop, whoop. Okay, sorry. I know it was a hard year. <laughs> but um, something that I studied in school was a couple of different communication theories, one of which was um, social penetration, which talks about how you develop relationships with people. And one of the key pieces in developing relationships with people, penetrating that social kind of bubble that you have, is mutual self-disclosure. So literally what Devery is saying as far as sharing, hey, this is what I'm going through, this is who I am, this is what I like, this is what you know, my preferences are, et cetera, that makes people more um, likely to share things with you as well. And so for me, I'm, I'm the same way where it's like, yeah, I'm in therapy, it's great, I was a mess. <laughs> and being able to kind of share that with my family and being able to share that with my friends, being able to share that with my grandmother, you know, and, and being able to start destigmatizing these things and also leading by example and realizing that your vulnerability is a strength and it's something that you should never be ashamed of your story is something that makes you who you are and so as you grow and as you learn and as you have these opportunities to have your worldview challenged and have you the, these opportunities to meet people who come from different backgrounds but have similarities with you you find those similarities and you find ways to build connection and that immediately creates that space to be able to, to, to talk about things that might be difficult to talk about things that you might feel should be hidden or you know that people might judge and you might want to be ashamed of and it's not something that you have to do because everyone has a story and everyone has an experience and so especially um, working with people my age and people my little siblings age on on issues like this the more that you share the more people want to share with you and you can do so up until the extent that you're comfortable it's no one's responsibility to share absolutely everything <laughs> and make you the spokesperson for all things nicotine for all things indigenous people issues for all things WNBA. but if you are at a position where you have a platform and a platform could be a thousand followers on Instagram. A platform could be, you know, I have a cool food page that I love sharing on, et cetera. You find ways to build those connections and then you find ways to talk about things that you are now educated on and can act on. And so for me, it's been this opportunity to learn about how nicotine and tobacco are environmental issues, how it's a social justice issue, how it's a mental health issue, and how it affects so many pieces of our lives. Because I didn't you know, get into activism to talk about nicotine. That wasn't something that I was aware of. I was doing you know, voter registration drives. I was like, you know, doing the HBCU college student thing. And then I learned about this opportunity to be able to address a really pressing crisis, especially as I was kind of really getting into, into my involvement with truth. And so. I love that we have this incredible honor and, and privilege and also responsibility to, to make life just a little bit better for the people that are coming behind us. And I think that it's an opportunity to grow as people to also be able to, 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 to engender that bravery you know, that you get when you're, when you're sharing with people on the things that matter to you. I, um, I love that. And I want to talk more about visibility, right? We always talk about representation and visibility. We love those words. Um, but for you, Devery, with Reservation Dogs, this like amazing show that just got renewed for a second season. Um, I love that it approaches these very serious issues through humor. And so, you know, like Gianna's saying, with you know, essentially accessing and breaking that bubble and entering those communities, I feel like the show is genius at doing that via humor. But I would love for you to speak more about, you know, the serious issues that the show has been able to approach and kind of your role in having this platform now to talk about indigenous issues, be it suicide, be it, you know, lack of resources. What has that opportunity been like for you? The opportunity has been incredible and one that I hold with like such a great sense of responsibility that I'm more than happy to uh, carry and hopefully share with other people as more indigenous folks flood the film industry and have projects coming up. Um, Reservation Dogs is such a special project to each of us who have been fighting for some of us decades uh, trying to break the through to the industry and it was the very first show that had an all indigenous uh, team of directors and all indigenous writers room a couple of whom are actually here with me tonight um, <laughs> Uh, as well as a, an all indigenous core cast. And that was the first of its kind. And, and I think in watching the show, you can really tell because it was a show by us for us. And with all of the mourning, healing, and celebration of our communities infused throughout the show and talking about the issue of suicide through Reservation Dogs, it's, 
it was one that in our native way we dealt with through humor um, my mom has always said if you don't laugh you're gonna cry yeah. and I'm like yeah but also therapy <laughs> <laughs> um, but it it's such a, a such a survival mechanism that our communities have really adopted as well as many other marginalized communities have have coped with many of the things we faced through humor and and with reservation dogs that's no exception and I uh, had the privilege of playing the character Alora Dannon, who is really close, but also is mourning the passing of uh, her dear friend Daniel, who died by suicide the year before. And it's an issue that's affected each of us in our communities, but also almost every family. And many of us derive from our personal experiences in creating, uh, specifically the episode uh, that Tazba Chavez uh, had directed and and written. And um, it it's such a such a major issue for indigenous folks and was one that we really put our heart and soul into it wasn't merely a storyline it was one of one of truths for our communities and and one that we wanted to tell with the utmost respect watch the show that's your homework watch it and the WNBA my next question for NECA um, I I think about the walkout last year and how big of a deal that was, right? That the players in the WNBA first walked off. Um, and in, in regards to Black Lives Matter and just everything that was going on last year, um, it, was, it was last year, correct? Was it? Yeah. Because all the years are blending. Oh Unbelievable. Like, was it that this was year? Was it last year? I can't remember. That was last year. Um, and this idea of, like, you know, shut up and dribble, like, not wanting athletes to have a voice beyond just performing on, you know, on the court. And so what do you say to that? Um, you know, what do you say to that? What was some of the, the, the I don't want to, not so much the backlash, but I guess what were some of the things that could have deterred you from speaking out about the issues that were at hand? And has the league or the, the industry at all changed for the better in terms of, you know, lifting up what you all are saying and what you're standing for within the athletic space? Um, so, to anyone that says shut up and dribble, I always say, I wish I could. <laughs> you know, I wish that's all I had to worry about, but that's not the reality, you know? We all wish we could just do our thing, but that's just not how the world is. That's not how history is. And so um, when we had that, uh, that moment, I mean, I will never forget that day. I was heading to the arena um, in the bubble in Florida, and, you know, we were the second game pegged to play, but when we got there, Atlanta and DC were not warming up. It was like 10 minutes before the game. They were sitting there talking about what the shooting of Jacob Blake meant to them. Um, not to the league, not to their teams, but to people individually. We had players on teams that had their sons in the bubble. We had players on teams that had their significant others who were black men in the bubble. Um, and then of course, our league is over 70% black women. Um, and of course, we have, we have so much standing in the LGBTQ plus community. Like, there was just so much that was weighing on us on top of being in a bubble in the pandemic that just led us to, to take a break. You know, at, at the end of the day, um, we have a platform because we play. Um, so who are we to not use that platform for something that is bigger than what we're doing on the court? Uh, we dedicated that season to Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name. Um, we dedicated our season to Breonna Taylor, um, amongst so many other black women that have been so negatively, fatally affected by uh, injustice in our country. And so for us, it, it really actually pushed us to the wall. It wasn't just about what it meant to us, it was about the burden that we hold as women in our community who are disproportionately affected by everything. In a world in which women were losing their jobs at the highest rate, yeah. we had to make a decision whether or not we wanted to play in the bubble because yeah. we had the opportunity to not be a part of that percentage hmm. and what that meant to other women. Um, we also had the honest of us figuring out how we were going to make an impact in a season where we could not go anywhere, <laughs> yeah. um, but we had to use our voice collectively um, as the world was reckoning with a lot of people's introduction to um, to violence on black lives, but most certainly not an introduction to many people. And so that was also very layered and frustrating. Um, and ultimately we decided that in that moment, basketball was not important. 
Um, we needed not only time to reflect on what it meant to us to have the platform and what the season and how we dedicated it to represents our communities and those who are watching us, but also for us to take a mental day. We took a mental three days. It was three days of mental health in which we used to provide resources for players who needed what they needed in that time, in such a heavy time. And also we used those three days to hopefully, actually not hopefully, we were able to get um, all players who were el eligible to vote registered in those three days. So we, that's what we used for those three days. We weren't focused on anything else. We had our first ever in player, all player in person meeting. All 144 players were in the room and we just hashed it out. We talked about it. Um, and so that time was so monumental in so many different ways, not just because of our response to what was happening in the world, but because of how we were able to get to where we were. And now we have a social justice council, which is not a one-time thing. Um, we continue to uphold pillars that are represented in the work that we do in the WNVPA. I'm now actually going to go back to our executive director and see if we can do more um, for awareness for indigenous people because that's something that we need to continue. We have, we have to represent everybody, you know? We have to represent everybody because we've had, we've had an impact. We've had a great impact of women who, who um, come from indigenous backgrounds and Shoni Shimmel. She was huge when she was playing in the league. And, and it's just on us to be able to bring that awareness because ultimately, we, that's what we represent. We have to represent the people, the, the women that are sitting next to me, the men that are sitting next to me, anyone. And, and I think that, that those three days were really representative of what we are about as women of the WNBA. And, and of course, women that are intersectional, not just in what we do on the court, but what we do off the court. And so um, I'm really grateful for that time. I would not do 2020 again. <laughs> I wouldn't do it again. But yeah, I wouldn't do it again. But I'm so grateful for what I learned, especially in those three days. And I'm really glad that you asked me about that because th those were three formative days for our, for our league and for the women of our league. Three productive days. Oh yeah. Y'all oh, yeah. didn't just sit and chill. Yeah. I definitely did it. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm sure you did it. I'm sure you did it. I'm sure you did it. Okay, so we have time for question and answer or questions. So if anybody has questions, don't be shy. I know it's chilly, but come on up. Hello, hi everyone. My name is Sandy, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all. I have really enjoyed this panel. Um, so it's funny because I was thinking about um, intergenerational trauma and how it's important for us to center intergenerational healing. And then Kawina Hire Devery brought it up, and I just would love to hear more about how you personally center healing in your own practices and also for your community. And I would love to hear from the whole panel if possible as well. And if that entails maybe like being, like creating non-productive non places for yourself where it's like, I'm just not gonna be productive and that's my resistance. I don't know if that includes it, but I would just love to hear more about that, like your resistance and your healing. Thank you. Love Thank you, Nyamoko. Thank you so much for that question. Um, in some of the, the ways I'd listed before, which were when talking about my community, making sure that I am being open about my experiences with therapy, but in my, in my storytelling as well, uh, making sure that I'm featuring, featuring stories that are for us, but also center our joy and center our humor and center the women from our communities and, and not only the struggles, but the, um, heartwarming experiences and exactly like you said i i also make sure that i take time for rest because that is the time where it's regenerative and i especially with the pandemic i haven't been back to my community nearly enough back to my reservation which is a place where i go to to refuel and to be around other ganyat gahaga when i'm out in the world i feel like i have to carry so much more than myself uh, whereas when I get to go home, I just get the opportunity to like be me and be around other Gunit Gahaga and it's it's such a weight off. Um, and so, so those are some of the things that I do uh, when centering healing and also having conversations with um, with my family and, and other community members. 
I'm a crier. I believe in tears. I believe it gets the hurt out. That's what my mom taught me. Big fan. No, and I say that because I think so many of us feel this pressure to be strong absolutely all the time. And especially when you're doing activism in any space, your belief is that if I show weakness, then they're going to take advantage of me. They're not going to take me seriously. It's going to make my job harder in the long run. And I think in being vulnerable and being honest with our mental health at any given time and, and leading by saying, listen, I'm human. And I honestly don't owe you all of me in order to be able to participate in this particular action or be part of this cause. And so, thank you. Keeping that in mind and going, okay, this is something that I do, this is not who I am. And then taking space away for yourself where maybe for you it's family. Like I literally have my cousin here with me because I knew I would feel better if I have someone who knows and loves and you know helps me be more like me in these spaces where I do have to speak on difficult issues or when I have to feel things that you know I don't necessarily want to feel and so making sure that you're mindful of the things that bring you peace and the things that center you and finding ways to kind of tie that in with the other pieces of your life it helps everything balance just a little bit better and then you take the space that you need to to cry or to you know do the typical self-care things of face masks or whatever if you have that luxury or to just sit and journal or to sit and scream or to sit and and be in that uncomfortable place and find ways to get out of it go hey i don't like how i'm feeling right now but let me look into resources that are available let me find out if there's anything that i can do um, to come outside of that and so I think it's a super, super important thing to do, and I love the idea of not being productive. It's like one of my favorite things. So <laughs> making sure that you honor that part of yourself while also going, okay, but because I am somebody, because I have a purpose, because I have you know, this calling on my life for whatever reason to you know, be part of something bigger, let me just start with one thing, whether that's you know, fighting for visibility for indigenous people, whether that's you know, pressing for the issue of mental health and the importance of mental health in the WNBA, if you're tall enough, and, <laughs> and making sure that you're actually like taking that one step, even if it's not becoming the person at the very forefront of the issue. Every piece matters, every piece helps. Well, I wouldn't say that I'm a crier, but I'm a feeler. So I'll say that. I love that you said that because um, I think there's this pressure to constantly just, you know, have it figured out, you know, really just, why are you crying? Why do you feel that way? And, and I, I learned very early on in um, these past couple years that boundaries are important, but I think boundaries on ourselves are more important. Yeah. Like, that's what you have to realize because <laughs> when when we had to quarantine initially i was like i'm gonna wake up whenever i want i'm gonna work out whenever i want i was eating breakfast at like two o'clock and i was like that's not gonna work and i didn't feel good yeah. so like that's me though like i'm a, i love routine but it to the point where it can be a fault where um i needed to set boundaries on myself and understand that sometimes it's okay to not do um sometimes like you said it's better not to it's almost more productive at times to not do. So making sure that we set those boundaries on ourselves and understanding that it's okay to just be is, is really where it's at. And, and you know, whatever, whatever modalities that are necessary for you to be able to find that self-care, because I think self-care is definitely so commercialized now, especially when people start talking about mental health. But one thing that I found that works for me is okay i'm not going to sit here and like try to put on a face mask sit in the bathtub even though i do those things but you know like try to do all the things that everyone says is so trendy for self-care i found it easiest to do things that i already do yeah. you know so like i love drinking tea so when i drink tea sometimes i just do that i don't try to multitask when i'm doing it mm. you know like so things that you already do in your life that you actually really do enjoy kind of make it a little bit more ritual you know and and don't don't waste time trying to do something else while you're doing something that you enjoy because it then it just disappears it doesn't become that so i think that creating that type of ritual nature to things that you already enjoy is really important um and for me personally it helped me spiritually honestly because i i was taking those moments to be able to just hey i like drinking tea let me sit down and just drink tea yeah. and i think setting those boundaries on ourselves is very important Y'all gonna kill me, but we only have time for one more question. I'm sorry, y'all. Okay, this one's a really quick one. So whenever you're having a bad day, is there anything, like any movie, any TV show, any book that you guys like to turn on and go into? It's a really light one. It's a really <laughs> Master Chef Junior. Oh. 
That's okay. it for me. MasterChef Junior, and I have like a ho I'm a I love watching TV, but I have like a host of shows that I love watching. But MasterChef Junior, The Office, uh, Reno oh, 911, yeah, um, Modern Family, like I I love I love watching. Yeah. I'm a foodie, so like that's me. Yeah. I just had to get that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Shit's Creek, and I'll watch the whole thing yeah. over and over and over and over. <laughs> there you go. You guys get it. You get it. The bibbies, you know. So. <laughs> Also a foodie, so I would say Great British Bake Off. Yes. It's just so wholesome. Yes. You guys are you guys are just yeah. these are all my shows. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah. That was a good question. Oh my goodness. Can I sneak one more in? Okay, I can do one more. Okay, hi, my name is Arpa, and I'm a psychology major, so I actually learn a lot about mental health throughout my <laughs> years at school. And obviously, with the pandemic, all of our depression and anxiety levels have skyrocketed. What's one thing each of you did to help reduce your stress? Ooh. Or like altered or a new habit maybe you formed that you didn't know you would? Oh my God. Uh, I'm gonna actually start with this. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, I love my five minute journal. Um, our old editor in chief, Lindsay, um, gifted it to me at the top of this year and it's a five minute journal that you literally write five things you're grateful for, five things you look forward to today, um, and you know one thing about yourself that you love. And I think for me, especially like the older I get my memories, it's hard for me to remember some things, it's nice to just log my days, but it's also nice to literally like pinpoint out what I'm excited and happy about, because I think it's gonna sound so woo woo, but like when you write things down and you manifest things, you're like, damn, some of that stuff actually happened today. Like even if, if it's little stuff, like I'm gonna make a really great meal for dinner. I'm gonna buy some things and make really good, I don't know, mac and cheese tonight. Like I'm gonna buy my noodles and all that, and I did it. And those little things, I think that's kind of what Neka was saying, like savoring, even when I eat, like I savor bites. Do you know what I'm saying? Like for real, cause like we made it through hell last year. So I think it's really important to just pause for the cause and take record of your life. Right? Because in 2010, whatever year, from now, you want to look back and be like, damn, I lived. Yeah. Right? And this is, what I, this is where I was in that moment. Yeah. For sure. Um, and I think I'm going to take kind of a different, um, I guess, take on that particular question. Because for me, it doesn't do me any good just as the person that I am. I'm super type A. I'm super organized. And if things go left, it freaks me out. And so for me, it's going, OK, let me center with what I want. This is my big goal. This is the thing that I want to do. What is one very practical thing that I can do to take one step closer to that? And so for me, the hardest part is figuring out what I want. Because I think we're so engineered to go, okay, what's the most practical? What's going to allow me to save the most money? What's going to last the longest long term, et cetera? But actually centering and going, what do I enjoy? What do I like? Who am I at my core? And going from there, and then taking that one step. And of course, I would be absolutely completely full of regret if I didn't mention, if that is something you're struggling with as far as nicotine vaping is concerned, we have This Is Quitting, which is an amazing service that's already helping over 400,000 young people. Um, you can text Ditch Vape to 88709. If I butchered it, come talk to me after. I'll help you. <laughs> to whatever it is that it is um, that you're trying to you know, a, a, attack, whether it's a goal, whether it's a thing that you want to do, um, there's, there's always resources. There's always somebody that can help. And so figuring that out for yourself and then just going for it, taking a little step. Yes, but quick. <laughs> I'd be talking. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> uh, similarly to Neka and Danny, I also like to take moments of being present in just what I'm doing. And especially over the pandemic, I found myself being like a home cook. Um, okay, and, chef. <laughs> and love just like cooking myself meals that are healthy, but also because they just taste good and they nourish my body and it forces me to be present in the moment through like what feels like meditation because if I'm not present then my food's gonna burn yeah. and it, it every night it just provides me a nice escape from the rest of my day um, and that was just like a, a small way that I was able to meditate and be present yes we have to exchange recipes <laughs> um, very 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 much in alignment with Danny um, I actually have been journaling for a while and um, that's something that I hold very true. And um, in accordance with that, something that, I, that I've 
used to reduce stress. I was always the person that was like uh, finding an excuse not to do stuff. And so now I do more stuff and um, I meet great people. I say yes to more things. Um, that's me. That may not work for everyone, but I found so much joy in being present in those moments instead of just kind of going through the motions, present in my cooking, present in my, in my journaling. So being able to really relish the fact that I get to meet new people because before this, we didn't think that was going to happen. So um, I'm really just, I love being in new situations and new environments and meeting new people and hearing their stories. You all were amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Okay, we are gonna, I'm gonna give you hugs. Save COVID, save hugs.